meeting is being recorded. So, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. My name is Sagar Kapoor, and I'm part of Customer Success Team at Tableau. And welcome to VisConnect. So, VisConnect is all about connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. So, just to tell you more about VisConnect, so VisConnect is a platform which helps people to inspire and get started with all the Tableau amazing Tableau community initiatives which everyone is running. So, so far we have hosted close to 22 sessions with 27 speakers, uh, six of them are just the Zen master plus one today. We have someone special. So we have covered close to 4,000 plus attendees, 300 plus subscribers on the YouTube channel and 600 plus members on the LinkedIn group. And this is all because of the amazing Tableau community, which we have. As I told, so all the sessions which are presented in VisConnect are recorded and then they are published to the VisConnect community channel. Then we also have a VisConnect LinkedIn group. So I will ask everyone to go ahead and join. I think some amazing content is waiting for you guys over there. So without further ado, let me introduce you to today's speaker. So today's speaker is a is a newly tableau Zen master, Lindsay Besendal. So she has been a, a Tableau certified associate with over 15 years working in the healthcare industry, and now is a consultant at Health DataWiz, a small data visualization company. She has having roles in direct clinical care, quality management, and data analytics and visualization. Lindsay has a strong roots in user experience, dashboard development, infographic design, and ensuring data insights result in action. And the fun fact about her is that she has no formal data visualization training because her actual education and degree was in psychology, marriage and family therapy. She used to have her own marriage and family therapy private practice. So Lindsay, welcome to VisConnect. Over to you now. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, let me share my screen over here. We good? Yes, we can see the screen. Perfect. So, good afternoon, good evening, folks on the other side of the world. I'm here in Pennsylvania on the East Coast, and it is about 6 30 in the morning. And I was sharing right before we started, um, I've had two cups of coffee, so I think I'm going to be pretty good. <laughs> um, didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Uh, my family's sick. So, but uh, I'm really excited to be here. So, thank you so much for inviting me on. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Polygons. I know this is something that is shared a bit in the Tableau community, um, but really, I want to share how I kind of came to need this in a visualization, my thought process, my inspiration, and how uh, I use this. But also, I'm going to provide some use cases that maybe you could use this technique or even expand upon it. So let's get started. So as I already mentioned, my name is Lindsay Betzendahl. I'm a consultant at Health Data Viz, um, new Tableau Zen Master. I've also um, been a Tableau Public Ambassador. And I'm the Virtual Health Tug co-leader with three other folks. And I also run Project Health Viz, which I'll share about briefly just to give some uh, background about it. And I have been using Tableau for almost six years, analyzing mostly healthcare data. And as mentioned, I did spend many years as a behavioral health clinician, uh, but found a love for Tableau, as many of us do, and got very involved in learning more about Tableau and then the Tableau public and the Tableau community. So real quickly, back in 2014 was when I started discovering Tableau, and I'm sure this resonates with many people. I stumbled upon it because the company I worked at did not have very good graphical representation of their data. And I kind of became a little self-taught. I just played around with it at night at home 
at work when I could and proposed to my company that Tableau should be what we should get to uh, use to visualize our data. And we did. Um, and so for four years, I managed a group of Tableau analysts. I was a Tableau administrator of the server and did all of most of our dashboard designs. So I got really immersed into Tableau. It took a while until I found kind of the Tableau community. Um, so I think it's wonderful for any of you who are listening in, who are already involved, you're participating in BizConnect, right? These are great opportunities to learn and grow uh, quickly. So I started participating in Makeover Monday uh, in 2018. I started a blog, I got onto Twitter, I really got involved so I could learn. And in uh, 2009, I started uh, Project Health Biz in 2018 actually, but in 2019, continued to um, grow that space. And Project Health Biz is a monthly data visualization project specific to healthcare data. So the goal of Project Health Biz is to tell the stories of our health. And early on in um, my community participation, I discovered there was not a lot of visualizations about what was going on in healthcare. And that is a very broad range uh, of topics, but I saw a lot on music and politics and sports, which is great and all, but they weren't necessarily going to change the world or um, bring about some uh, awareness of situations around the world. So that's what Project Health Biz is. Um, and I use that platform to help other folks uh, visualize healthcare data and tell these stories. It's a lot about storytelling uh, and growing your skills there. I also started in 2020, um, or in the 2019-2020, Moms Who Viz, and that is a growing community of um, mothers, working mothers who are in the data viz uh, field and trying to connect with them as we have some unique uh, challenges or um, needs to connect with other people in this space. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Tableau Ambassador and Zen Master and I've been doing uh, some speaking. So that is that. So what I wanna talk about is kind of how we got to, or how I got to needing this um, radial tab polygon chart as I'm calling it. So one of the Project Health Biz data sets was on prostate cancer. And the data set was not terribly complicated. It had incident and mortality rates by state and in the US for multiple years. And I really struggled with it. So I'm no different than anyone else. I get this block all the time where I just cannot figure out how to visualize something. And for whatever reason, this particular data set, I just did not know what direction I wanted to go. I struggled with it for like a whole month. And one night, uh, I was in bed on my laptop trying to figure out an idea. It was probably coming to the end of the month, and I knew I had to put out my visual for the project that I was running. And I was thinking about it. I had talked to a friend of mine whose husband had had prostate cancer. And she had told me something that I didn't know, which was that <clears throat> while the mortality rates for prostate cancer have dropped dramatically, um, at least particularly in the US, about 99% of people are surviving prostate cancer, especially after treatment, that there is this other side, the other side of the coin, where there were a lot of side effects um, that people were having that weren't necessarily being talked about. And so I got this idea kind of about the Vitruvian man. So if you are familiar with art or Leonardo da Vinci, he drew the Vitruvian man, which was representing the ideal human body proportions. And so I thought about this concept of here's some data. It looks great, you know, quote unquote, perfect, right? Mortality rate, incident rates going down, fantastic. But it's not really perfect, right? There's this other aspect of people, real people who have prostate cancer and have side effects, surgery side effects, particularly around sexual functioning and things of that nature. And there's some shame in that. And so I got this idea of the Vitruvian man to use as the centerpiece and the storytelling around this data. Well, as I'm in bed, I realize the best way to do this, I need to have some kind of circular chart. <laughs> and I am a big proponent of not using radial charts a lot. I get really frustrated with people who use radial charts uh, because sometimes they don't encode data very well. But this is a little different, which I'll explain. And uh, so this is the viz in the end that I use this radial tab polygon to provide me that circle around the Vitruvian man, which was the centerpiece of the story I was trying to tell. 
So that's the background into why we did it. And then I'll share how to do it. <laughs> so the, the three main skills you're going to need are data densification, which in this case, we're going to duplicate our data four times in order to calculate these four points uh, for each of those tabs, so to speak. Then we use some trigonometry, as you probably would expect, uh, to get all the radial calculations to get our um, points all around this, the circle. And then we'll have coordinates, right? And we're going to plot those X and Y coordinates and set our particular dimension to our detail and get our polygons. Now, I am going to go into Tableau and do all this, but um, for those uh, listening to this later and even now, right, this is kind of the general snapshot of what you need to do in case you need to go back and remember. Here's the, the page. Like I said, we're duplicating data first. The first thing we need to do, um, there's actually two ways to do this, what I'll share, which I'll share. Uh, and Tableau will create a field called table name, which we are going to use to create a path order field. And that path order field is going to connect those four points for us and draw those lines, draw the polygon edges. In this, we're going to use three parameter fields, and these help us adjust very specifically our radius, so how big we want our tabs to be, how long, and then also how narrow, so the spacing between them, and I'll show you that. And then we make seven calculations, which we're going to do, and then we'll build the viz, and we use the X and Y uh, coordinates that we'll make, the dimensions, uh, mark polygon, and some other aspects. And then we customize it, right? We'll use some of those parameters, we'll clean up some formatting, and we'll show you how we do that. But before we get to it, just because this is in PowerPoint, um, my website is Viz and Data. There is a blog on this that I had written a little bit back. Um, you can find me on Tableau Public as well. I did last night post, I have to unhide it still, but I did post the actual workbook that we're going to show so you can go and download it and use it to rebuild stuff and really see all the calculations if you just want to copy them. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at ZendallData. Um, I tweet all the time. All right. Hopefully you still see my screen. All right, so as I said, this was the actual visualization that I had created. So you'll see um, each of these tabs, right? We get some data in it. This does have some um, filter actions where the values are changing in here. And what you'll see is, right, each of these are individual polygons. The other thing that uh, you may not notice, but is that this is actually a background image here. So I have this within this chart. It is not a floating image. And that is one of the benefits of this particular chart type is you can do this background image in here. All right. So like I said, kind of a disclaimer, I don't think you should use radial charts in business settings. Clearly, this is for other purposes. Um, but things like radial charts, uh, radial bar charts, particularly pedal charts, um, they're often very prone to misunderstanding and often inaccurate assessments of values. So I don't advocate using those, but the radial tab polygon chart we're going to go over today does not use length to encode values. So the only thing that we're encoding here is color around the path of a circle. So ultimately, there's no data manipulation, right? We're going to use two examples today. One is going to be state. And I have state going around the circle alphabetically. Now, granted, you can sort your polygons, um, the dimension on your polygon, any way you want. And I'm doing month year, so we'll show it as a time series, which is also pretty effective for a circle. But again, use any of these with caution. All right, but before, there is an alternative, right? So when I first did this, a friend of mine said, well, why didn't you just do a donut chart? I said, well, I could have, of course. So we're going to see quickly what the issue is with the donut chart. You know, and if this were a class, I'd say, who wants to raise their hand? Because the issue is we can see this slice. I can see this whole uh, mark, uh, this wedge being highlighted, and I don't particularly like that. The other thing is if someone were to click on this, you actually see the entire pie in the background, which I also don't particularly like. Because uh, I don't really want you to think it's a pie chart because it's not supposed to be a pie chart. But we're still going to make it because this is an alternative and it's way faster. Um, and if you don't know how to do it, uh, I'm just going to go over really quickly. So all we have to do is we're going to draw 
drag state to detail, which of course Tableau likes to pull out everything else. And then we're doing this by profit. So I'm gonna profit on color. We'll change this to a pie. And that was super fast. Um, I also like to do an extra thing where I put um, my actual like count distinct on angle, even though because each of these marks is only one of them for the state, it tableau is automatically going to give it all a value of one and divide it by 360. Um, just to be safe, depending on my data. And then all we do is do this min zero. And if you don't know what that's doing, it's just plotting this pie chart on an axis, a pretend axis, really. And the only reason we do that is oops, so we can add a second one and plot them on top of each other. But we have to have the, the axes to do that. So now that we have that, we can make this a dual axis. And now we have both of our pie charts on top of each other. And the second pie chart, we'll just take all this back off and we'll see that's our second pie chart. And I had already colored it white. Um, I'll make it smaller and then you can see it. So here's, you'll see as we do this, like how difficult some of the sizing is, right? I have to kind of finagle my size. Okay, that looks pretty good. Then I have to make sure the syncing's all good. Get rid of all these axes. We'll format it a little bit. All right, get rid of the um, zero lines, get rid of all these lines. And then we have our polygon. And, you know, one of the other issues you'll see in our tooltip, it says min zero. So technically, I've got to go in here and delete this stuff in my tooltip. And actually, our second one also, our second pie has a tooltip, and so I got to do that too. You see how this kind of comes to pain. But there you have it. So Here's our pie, it, it worked, um, sorry, our donut chart, it works. Just not as quite as clean. So we're gonna build the second one too that I'm gonna show, because we're gonna do both of these as polygons and show you how they kind of look and work. So the second one is using rat sightings in New York City. And so let me go back to the rat. Okay, so this one is using date, uh, a date field to make our, our circle. So we're gonna do month, year. Uh, so I want these slices to be month, year. And this is just a number of records. And then we're gonna change this to a pie. And it's already super big for some reason. So there we go. So this looks really trippy, but we kind of get the sense of how this will look. And then again, same thing. We're gonna do that min zero. Oops. Do that twice. Dual axis, drop this stuff off, and then make the top one bigger to make it really big. There we go. And oops, see, too big. <laughs> and then we're going to change this color to something a little more interesting. Uh, is this what I want? Yeah. Cool. So here you can see that um, this type of time series is, is effective, I think. I can really point out without even um, knowing, I can guess what some of this is, right? So it's getting a little, the colors are getting deeper in the summer months. People are seeing more rats in the summer. So these are the summer, right, each year. And you can see as years have progressed, the summer is, there's even more, right? We're getting into these really dark purples and blacks. So. I can see seasonality even in this circle. Now, granted, um, here's the final one. Granted, a, a line chart would show us that as well, but you get the picture. All right. So I've pretty much alluded to this, but let's just put it down on paper. Donut chart limitations. Upon hovering, every slice is shown. The entire pie slice is selected. You can see it. Um, it lacks precision formatting. I mean, you actually just saw me kind of fumble around with the sizing of these uh, circles. And there were two sets of tooltips that I had to clean up, which sometimes you forget about and then you have it and someone can see your min zero calculation. Also that inner pie is just a color, so you can't use a transparent sheet or a background image in it, right? There's a color there, which is limiting in terms of if you're putting this floating on a visualization and you want something in the background, this won't work. Okay, 
So the tab polygon. Our donut chart is actually going to really help us figure this out. So you'll see here when we did the pie chart or the donut chart that our pie intersected these four points, which is what we're going to calculate here. So we need two points at the inner distance, so the inner radius, and two points at a further distance from the center, a different radius. So the three parameters we'll make, uh, I'll show you how they work. So one is our inner radius, literally from the center to these two points, or right here. And if I change this to five, you'll see it got smaller. Uh, the radius got smaller, and so our little tabs got longer. Same with this outer radius. I can adjust this either way, and both of these are adding together to get our full distance. So depending on what I do, it's going to, I do two, like I'm just going to get bigger. Um, the space between the tabs is this little white space. So if I make it less, you'll see it almost closes up. If I go up to like nine, you'll see, right, it gets even bigger. Let's see if I can go, how big I can go, All right? So we can get even smaller wedges. And you'll see, see how my text is actually behind it. You'll see how this is transparent. So there's no circles, right? You can put stuff behind it if you wanted to. So let's go back to our original, which was 10.5. There we go. All right, so setting it up. So the first thing is you bring in your data four times. Now, I did this literally because I was in bed when I figured this out, and it was just easier for me than opening up my Excel spreadsheet to just drag in my sheet name three more times. And so you're just unioning them together. Uh, and so Tableau will just rename them and you'll have your four uh, data sets. Now, obviously you have to be careful when you're doing any other calculations using your data that it's duplicated four times. So you're either gonna need to do average or you're gonna need to filter by one of the sheets if you're using other like charts using the same data set. You can also do with another sheet, um, a column called path order with values one through four and then a join column that just has the value one. And then you can do a join calculation on your original sheet and this one, and it'll duplicate the data for you as well using the join. Again, I was just lazy at the moment. I just dragged them all in. I found that pretty simple. Either work. And then we create these three float parameters. So you'll start by creating a radius parameter, a radius two, and a spacing parameter. And that's what I just showed you how those work. Now, I'm going to go through all these calculations in detail in an actual worksheet, but these are all of them. So if you needed to just copy this and use it, that's good too. But I really think it's helpful to understand how calculations work before you build something uh, instead of just taking some calculations from somebody else and not understanding the math or the concept behind it. These are actually pretty simple. Um, I'm no math whiz. Uh, like I said, this is not even like necessarily my background. I, though I was good at math in school, um, I can't say that all this comes supernaturally. So first we'll build a path order calculation, which as I mentioned earlier, is just taking our sheet name. So take each of our sheet and assigning it a point. So in my case, um, I did it this way. I did one, two, three, four. You could go any direction. You just have to know which ones you made one, two, three, and four whether the inner or the outer. <clears throat> so this is how I did it. So my one and four on the inside, my two and three are the outside. Uh, well, I'll get to that actually later, but um, you just have to name them all. We'll use index and index is just gonna count around our circle. It's gonna give us just a value for an order, which one is gonna be one, two, three, four, all the way around. Our angle is gonna take you want your uh, a distinct count of whatever you you want around your circle. So if it's um, in my Vitruvian man viz, it was a field called area in Superstore. It's state in a rat sighting. It is our month year, and so we're just do a count distinct of that. We're fixing it so that no matter what, we're getting that accurate count of what we have. Now you may, depending on uh, how you're using this or filtering or what have you, you may or may not want to do that. Um, and then you're dividing, three, six, dividing it by 360, so you get your angle. Then we take degrees, so we're going to take our angle, and then we multiply it um, differently, right? So I said if the path order was one or two, 
I want my angle to take the index. So this, let's say this is index five. Because I have the spacing parameter, it's gonna change my angle just ever so slightly, right? So if it's one or two, it's gonna say index minus the spacing, which means it's gonna move inward, right? If it's three or four, it's gonna do index and I have to do minus one to get up a segment and then plus the spacing. So I'm going down a little bit. So that's how we're moving both of these ang both of these um, points uh, closer together as we're adjusting that spacing. Then we take radians and radians is just turning our degrees into a radians value. And then lastly, we take our, um, we're gonna use the rate, make a radius adjusted calculation, which is gonna tell us that if our path order is two or three, the outside ones, then I need to say, take the radius, that was our parameter value of 10.5 originally, plus our radius two parameter, which is 1.5. So we'll get 12 in that example, right? So if it's three or two or three, we're gonna get 12. Everything else, we're just gonna do that first parameter, which would be 10 and a half. So you get the idea of, it's just adding that extra um, value to make it longer. And then we make our XY using the cosine sign. Okay. So here's the example. So our path order, as I want, I'm gonna be able to see kind of how this works, right? This is how it's built and that's how it looks, right? Path order, one, two, three, four. Um, here we have it. There we go. Okay, an angle, right? We did the angle one I just showed you. Same thing. You'll see it's just dividing however many I have, which happens to be there's 49 um, values or uh, uh, dimensional values in this particular data set. Alaska and Hawaii weren't included. So um, 360 divided by the 49, or I mean, I'm sorry, um, 360 divided by, yeah, the 49 gets us the 7.3. And so you'll see every single state gets that 7.34 because that's, everyone has the same uh, value for that angle. What we need to do is turn that to degrees, which is that other calculation I just showed you. And so you'll see here, because I already have the spacing set at that 0 0.05, <clears throat> that the angles are getting slightly bigger. And even within the ones that are like right next to each other, right, they have that little space between them. These two are the same. And then we have a little space, right? So in, you get all the way up to our 360, right? So that's how our degrees are going around our circle. You'll have to see, you'll see that mine are, we look at they're out of order, like three, four, two, one, because of the way I started my one, two, three, four around that square, I went counterclockwise. So these are in the right order. It just, I had to pay attention to what I did there with my paths. And then radians. And here's our radius adjusted, which I mentioned. Literally, if um, the path is two or three, I, I resorted these so you can see it. If it's two or three, we're gonna take that radius plus the other parameter, right? That's how we got that 12. Otherwise, we're gonna do the inner and that's a 10.5, right? These are right here. Okay, so let's build it. So now that we have all that, we're ready to go. So we have our coordinates. We're gonna put X on rows, Y on columns, state on detail, and country. And nothing really happens as you may expect. So we have to compute using state. And now we have our part of our radius. Now we don't have um, our polygon yet, but let's do that. So we're gonna change this mark to polygon and that doesn't look right, but we haven't told Tableau how to draw the lines yet, how to connect them. And so we're gonna use what we did, which was table name, because those are our four points. Okay. Well, that doesn't look quite right either. However, I will say this is interesting. So if you need to create like a bow tie chart, I suppose you could, but what did happen? So what happened was it is plotting, I don't even know if I can kind of hover on it, but it didn't know the order that this should be in terms of the table names. So what you'll see is, there we go. Tableau, did it as orders, orders one, orders two, and orders 
number sign, I mean, not number sign, dollar sign. Problem is, this was actually the second one. So you'll see how that happens. Now you can move any of these around. You'll see you'll get all kinds of strange things depending on the order. It's just drawing an X now instead. So we want to make sure we get this in the right order. That's correct. So depending on your table names and how Tableau alphabetizes them, you may need to change it. Okay, but now we have it. So that looks pretty great. And it is going in order. We've got Alabama at the top and Wyoming at the end. So they're sorted alphabetically. Um, the state is by default. So we're going to add our profit to color. And that's pretty much it, right? All that we need to do now is any adjusting of the um, this stuff that we may want. So let's say we do want to make this a little bigger. You'll see that um, our axis just changes. So while that didn't do a whole lot, if I make this a lot bigger, I will. Let's just hypothetically we want that. And then all we have to do is format as you normally would for a chart, getting rid of some of these. these things and our zero lines, grid lines, axis rulers, and we just have to hide them. And then we would format the tooltips and we like to format one and just remove some of the things that are on here, like our X, Y stuff. Okay, let's do the rat sightings one, I think. It's pretty fun. Okay, so same thing. So again, once we have all this built, you really have a lot of flexibility and I'll show you some other cool things you can do too. So we'll do month year this time. And remember we always have to compute using whatever our level of detail is. We already have that up as a polygon. We need to get our table name to and path. And number of records and color and we don't want that color because it looks way better this one yeah there we go um and i don't have that looks pretty good and then we would format it again just to make sure we get rid of all this stuff and like i said let me i don't have my Using this one. Let's see what happens if I make this. No, I see it. Oh no, that did it. Okay. I need my spacing. Oops. Oh, there's zero. Let's try zero. It's fine. Okay. And here would be like the final view right some cleanup and like i said you know now that you have this you can put some other things in the center whatever you want and again it would be transparent as well but we can see our summer months really clearly so just going over a couple of use cases um this was an, an old one that simon beaumont did a while back and actually i had done this where i where i worked previously actually did use this uh, example um, for uh, hours of the day and we used it for um, a customer service call center visualization. Um, but this is a great example of where the polygon, the tab polygon may have worked better. Now, granted, he did use some color encoding in the center. So he actually used that donut chart as another data point. But again, this may be have been uh, a good use case for it. I actually came across this one literally yesterday, uh, which was kind of ironic. So I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> literally yesterday, uh, this guy posted this. I can't quite tell. I didn't download it. There's some places where the polygons aren't quite all lined up. So I'm like, you can kind of, I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, so obviously this was used um, for wine. We've got, again, he has a chart on the inside that's not just the donut. So that's pretty cool. So there's one other thing that I want to show. So because we talked about how you can use these polygons, you can kind of move around the points, you can move around these uh, radiuses, you can do a lot more um, formatting than you could with the donut chart. 
I'm going to show uh, how we can do this extension thing, right? We can change the radius of any of these polygons that we want, um, if it makes sense, obviously. But whether or not this makes sense is up for debate, but I'm just going to show you that you can do it. <laughs> so let's just say I had my rat sightings, right? We have this view, but I really want to call out this summer month even more. I, I want my user to be like, focus on the summer months, uh, draw your attention there even more than just the color. So what I could do is change the length of these polygons, the radius, just for the summer months to get them to like kind of pop out. Again, I'm not sure that you should or shouldn't do it. Um, but so I created a calculation called summer months. And so if the month is basically June to September, I'm going to say that's summer because those are the hottest months uh, here, at least um, in the US. Otherwise, it's not the summer, it's other. So I created a new radius summer calculation. And I know this looks like a lot, but it actually is not. <clears throat> if um, the summer months is summer, then all I want to do is do my original uh, radius adjusted calculation, which, if you recall, was saying if the path order was two or three, which were the ones that were on the bottom. I'm going to say, take that, um, and I know this says copy, that's just because I had to have a second one. So when I was adjusting spacing, it wasn't adjusting spacing in every single viz I was showing you, but it's the same thing. It's just these. Um, then I'm going to take the inner radius plus that outer one twice. So I'm just going to make it like twice as long. If it's not summer, I'm just going to do the original one that I was doing before, which was if it's the, um, or I'm sorry, the two or three were on the outside. If we're two or three, then do the original one, which is just this 12 plus five or whatever we have, right? Hopefully that makes sense. And I made two new X, Y, because I didn't want to get them all mixed up, but we have X and Y. And need our create date again. And compute using that create a date. Okay, and then we still need table name again. All right, so you can already see where this is going. And so basically, right, we just, oh, my tools have gone away, but anyway. Um, we've extended out these summer months. And so now they're just longer. And now you can adjust this any way we want. So our second radius is this, um, is making it twice as long now. So if I were to do something like 10, right, it's going to get, you know, even longer. Um, so you get the idea. Maybe we just want to pop it out a little. Or you can just make a lovely little sun. <laughs> But there's a lot of flexibility again, that's really the point. And so here's kind of that final one, which we just built. And so that is pretty much it. So I, my challenge to you would be, if you create one of these, um, let me know, either tag me on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, use the hashtag radial tab chart. Um, I would love to see like the creativity people come up with. I just think, yeah, maybe, um, you know, it's not the, the best thing to use all the time. I, I think for me, when I learned some of these things, it's helped me expand my thought process of Tableau and what Tableau can do. It doesn't mean I'm always going to be making polygons or using X, Y coordinates. Like, I don't think there's always a need for that. But it does make me think a little more creative, creative, creatively sorry, about how Tableau works uh, and what is possible. So, right, I tried to show some different things about what is possible with these tab polygons. You know, you can change the order of your table names to make strange shapes around. You can extend this radius, right? You can adjust and format these very specifically to your use case. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can do it. But I'd love to see if people come up with uh, other ways of using this, this method. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Lindsay, for sharing that. I think it was a great tip on how exactly we can do it. So thank you, and I think that's a great challenge for everyone to go ahead and participate. I will also do that, and I'm pretty sure to tag you and get your suggestions about it. So everyone now,
question, you can go ahead and ask questions from Lindsay. You can use the chat window or you can use the Q&A window. Yeah, I'm looking. I think before that, Lindsay, I think we will just wait for that. So I have a one question for you. Can you just tell us, tell us about your journey, how exactly you started with Tableau, and maybe you want to give three quick tips to everyone who is just a beginner? Yeah, so <clears throat> when I started, um, for me, what worked best was I just got very involved in using Tableau with data I knew. So. I didn't take a class at first. It, what was helpful to me was to just immerse myself in how Tableau worked. So I just messed around. I literally took some data at work that I had. Um, I tried making charts. You know, I just tried to see how Tableau worked. Uh, I wanted to get a feel for it. Um, it was kind of like learning to swim. Like you want to kind of get in the water. You don't want someone to tell you how to do it and then you get in the water. Like, I wanted to get in the water, feel what the water was like. You know, test out like how I could swim, right? And so that really helped me. And using data that I was familiar with, so I was very familiar with the data that my company used. I, I was in, you know, I was using. I had to report out on their data all the time, so the information and the metrics were familiar. So it helped me learn with stuff I knew. It, it's different than if you take a class and they're using data that or metrics um, that you're not really familiar with, uh, or you're doing even something publicly and like Makeover Monday, and it's not really information that you use very often. So I found that very helpful. I did, um, I actually didn't go to like Tableau's um, like trainings or even stuff they had online first. I actually started like just Googling stuff um, for um, blogs. I think the community was more helpful to me to learn things in kind of plain language, people that could um, spell that all out and then resources I had. But again, it was just a lot of playing around initially to get going. And then um, I did take a, a formal training after about six months. I took an advanced course, ironically, with the company that I currently work for. Um, but back then I had taken an advanced course with them and that helped me learn a little bit more about calculations. But really, most of what I did was just um, practicing a lot. I mean, I did it at home at night. I was just I loved it so much that that's. Um, how I built my skills early on was just playing around as much as I could in it. Yeah. You know, and I do think for other new folks, I mean, any type of community project, I think is very helpful. Um, like I said, I did get involved with makeover Monday. Um, the challenge, I mean, the challenge, I think some people have a challenge that I had was, um, feeling like I had to commit to every week. And I don't think you you have to, I mean, obviously you build your skills pretty quickly when you're forced or uh, encouraged to make a, a biz every week. But there's a lot of other things out there that you can um, participate in. And I say participate in the sense of any project, even such as Project Health Biz, which I run, um, you know, the main goal is you don't have to find data, right? You have data given to you, so that helps um, helps reduce the steps that you need to do to make a visualization. Um, and you know the and you get to practice and and then you get some feedback. So like those are the three key points for most projects out there. So I think people should you know find something that works for them. Uh, don't get overly um, uh, like you don't have to be like overly committed to it or um, have to participate all the time. But anything that helps you know improve your skills where you can play around. So uh, like this whole presentation, for example, it's really playing around, right? Like I was playing around, I was struggling with a visualization, I came up with a solution for it, but I wouldn't have come up with that solution at work. But that's not to say I didn't learn a whole lot, right? About how to conceptualize building things in Tableau, right? So any quote unquote playing or creative thinking, strange chart types, whatever, ultimately make me a better visualization expert in my you know, job, right? Because I think way more creatively um, and I can come to client challenges with just a different perspective because I've, you know, played around with Tableau personally and, you know, I have some interesting ideas of how Tableau works. So I think those are all really, you know, helpful to do. Perfect. Awesome. 
So Michelle has a question for you. So she is saying, great presentation. What are some of the use cases that might be good for this type of chart? She has a major fear of polygons and she promised to give a short one of these days. <laughs> Thank you, that'd be great. Yeah, I think there are use cases. I mean, like I said, I did use a similar concept uh, at work before with that um, donut chart for showing time. Time is a really good one. Obviously, we see the clock circularly, so I think those are effective time, uh, places for it. So, like like you saw in the rat sighting, there was some seasonality that kind of popped out. Um, you know, I think even still, it, you know, it could be good for even a starting point of a filtering, right? Like um, instead of a bar chart, uh, in my case for states, like at least in the U.S., like we know all of our states, right? We know pretty much how they fit alphabetically. Like if I'm looking for something like Montana, I know where the M's probably are around a circle based on how many states there are on either end of that. So you could use it even as like a selection in a small area of a visualization where it's like, hey, here are all your options, right? Or if you, if you had less choices in a dimension, like say you only had like 20, you know, putting them around a circle alphabetically may make sense for someone to be able to select one of those tabs and the data filter. I mean, it could be used that way too. I mean, I, I think people could probably think of some interesting ways to use the idea. I do like that it's um, the in, the inner uh, section is transparent. I think that uh, is way more effective. You could probably do a lot more things um, with being able to use it transparently than um, the donut chart. So can't wait to see what people do. And, and Lindsay, I have one question for you, and I think that is with respect to, do you want to tell us everyone about your journey from being a Tableau ambassador to a Tableau Zen master? Uh -huh. I think I think a lot of people and the folks are, I think, waiting to hear from you how exactly maybe going ahead, they can do in the same lines. Yeah, sure, I can try. Um, so, you know, I think the biggest thing, so I was a, the Tableau um, public ambassador um, that was started back in, I think, like August of 2019, I feel like. I think it's been longer, but it's probably only that long. Um, so really, for any of the type of ambassador um, roles, and there are, I think, five now, right? There's the forums, there's public, social, there's um, Tableau user group, and now there's student ambassadors. So that's a new one. And so each of the ambassador role, um, programs have different roles. Um, so for me, uh, the, the way, I mean, it's hard to say, like, how do you get there? Because a lot of it is, you know, the nomination and, and Tableau does uh, these choices. And so it's hard to uh, talk about these things as a path. I mean, these weren't things I tried to, uh, like a goal to achieve necessarily. But a lot of what Tableau values, right, as I'm sure folks know, is that really support and helping others, right? So for me, I mean, I love Tableau so much and I had the benefit of using it for many years before getting involved in the community. So once I got involved in the community and I saw all the wonderful things and support that people were sharing with uh, newcomers, it was only right for me to like give back. I mean, I had used people's blogs over those four years, right? Um, and so a lot of it is being um, helpful. And it doesn't mean that you a, have to have a blog. It doesn't mean you have to run a project. Like those things, um, I think people think like that's what you have to do. I think those are helpful, but really if you're visible in sharing your knowledge um, and that can be anything, that can be just helping others, um, you know, providing feedback to somebody who requests it. It can be behind the scenes, um, it can be, in the scenes, you know, on Twitter or LinkedIn, sharing your knowledge and um, providing feedback to others, supporting people, just being, um, you know, positive, resharing stuff. I think a lot of it is just helping other people grow. Um, so, you know, and for the for the ambassador role, uh, a, a lot of what we're required, quote unquote, to do is also be public uh, publishing visualization. So. You know, it's using the new the new techniques that Tableau is putting out in their releases. It's publishing um, to Tableau Public so that you have like a portfolio of things to be able to share um, with others. So it's really getting yourself out there. I, I will say um, all of this requires you know 
extra work. I mean, there's plenty of nights I'm in my office until nine o'clock. Um, so I've worked like a 12 hour day from work and then all this work. Um, but I love it, right? Like you have to have a passion for enjoying this work. You, you don't want to be, you know, writing blog posts late at night because you feel like you have to, I mean, that, that should not be the goal at all. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm honored, um, and still humbled to be called a table Zen master. I, I, I still wrapping my head around it. Um, I think it, there's such amazing people that are in that role, um, that I've looked up to too over the years. Um, so, you know, it's, it's more of a, wow, thank you for, you know, getting it. I, I don't know that it was ever a, I need to be a Zen master, but, um, you know, again, it's just, it's, it's all those things that make a, a Zen master that I think folks should be aware of is it is having knowledge of Tableau, but I think a lot of it is that collaboration and then that teaching, right? And however you teach, right? However you share your inference, your knowledge or your creativity or your skills or whatever it is, you know, just share it, you know, share it as, as you see fit, um, you know, and that like, just like this, you know, doing disconnect, you know, you're sharing, right? You're providing a platform for people to come together and share information. And that in and of itself is right. Teaching and collaboration. And I think that's a fantastic example as well of, um, just something that is helping, helping others. And that's the whole goal, right? We want to help each other grow and be better at, uh, this work in the software. And, and thank you a lot, Lindsay, for that. I think we all are proud that to call your talents in master. So I think yeah. Swati has one question for you. How do you decide how much to stretch in regards of designing how much in terms of creative chart types and maybe just going ahead and creating a bar graph? Can you ask the question one more? I think I missed part of it. So Swati is asking how much time do you spend literally on creating charts like polygons? Yeah. Or, and, or maybe versus a typical chart like a bar graph or a line chart. Yeah, so I mean, I don't, I don't typically do, um, I don't know that I typically do too many like crazy chart types. I, I do um, come from the perspective of, I really, you should err on making your data accessible and most uh, accurate for what you're trying to convey. Um, but that's not to say when I have done more, um, I'm trying to think. I probably have it up more complicated or creative things that they take a lot of time. I mean, they absolutely, um, some things come a little more naturally, but like, for example, I mean, uh, this, like Coxcomb, when I did, this took a lot of time. I mean, any of these radial stuff can take, um, time to figure out and make work correctly. Um, so, I mean, most of my visits take many hours. I mean, I, I'm, uh, which is, I think, part of why I moved away from Makeover Monday when it was kind of like pushing out a lot of visualizations in a short period of time. Uh, they do take a lot of time. So I have to balance, do I take a lot of time to make something that's going to be visually pleasing, but it has to be vis visually pleasing because I want to take the time to do it. I can't be doing it to impress somebody else because it's a waste of my time if I'm doing that. Um, you're right, because otherwise, um, there are places where bar charts and line charts and things like that are definitely the best thing to do. Um, and I, I, there's plenty of times where I make that choice to just do something more simple. Um, you know, like this one, there's bars and lines and a map. I mean, there's nothing complicated in the charts that I've done, but anytime I create a visualization, what I try to do is put something in that I've learned. So it may not be chart types, you know? So in this one, for example, I was messing around with collapsible containers. So that was, this, and like some LODs to make, you know, certain things pop out, but it's bar charts, line charts, and like, literally like, that's it. So I don't think you ever should have to, you know, make complicated line chart or complicated chart types. Um, there are some people out there in the public space that make beautiful charts uh, of visualizations and they're just bars and lines and they're fantastic and people who can do that well. Like, they've got something going on. If you can make interesting and engaging dashboards without all the, like, pomp and circumstance of, like, fancy charts, then you 
are like amazing, right? Like that's that's a skill to draw people in and still a simple chart. So uh, I hope that answers the question. But yes, they take a lot longer. Yeah. Um, but B, you know, they're they're not usually not necessary. And C, only do it if it's because you really want that visual, not because you think you got to impress somebody with making something fancy to put it out there. Because I, I think we, people can see through that too, and that's it's a waste of your time, right? You want to do it because you love it. Or you're learning something, right? Like either way. Yeah. Okay. And maybe the one last thing maybe you can just go ahead and talk about is the project. I think that is a great initiative from your side. So I think yes. it's a couple of minutes you want to talk about. Yeah, that would be great. Absolutely. I would be more than happy to. So um so here. So um I kind of alluded to it. So Project Health is is a monthly uh, data project. It started back in 2018 and um, specific around healthcare data. So I put, let me just, to the beginning of the month, so I better get my act together because Monday would be the beginning of the month. Um, <coughs> I put data up on data.world and you'll see it here. And so the data will be up here every month. Let's see if I can find it right so these are all the past month uh data sets that we've had and the goal is just to tell that story and the biggest thing i can say is you don't have to tell the whole story right you don't have to use all the data you can add supplemental data but you do need to use the data that's provided it could be the smallest part or the whole thing you can add stuff you can do whatever you want there's not um i don't have rules around that or anything but um, so you'll see some examples here. We had access to basic sanitation, uh, mental health prisons. This is one that I uh, collaborated with Sarah Bartlett for her Iron Diz one. We did African health facilities. There's the prostate cancer, autism, alcohol use, healthcare spending. I mean, you get the, the picture. Some of them are disease related. Some of them are class, right? It could be anything. I'm also wildly open to any suggestions or people have data sets, um, totally open to that especially if it's from uh, another country or part of the world. Um, I know some of my data has been US based, mostly because it's easier for me to find that data, but I definitely want to expand that. And so the data is put out there and then um, wait, wait. Uh, folks are encouraged to visualize that. And so you'll see, and I do have a tracker. So any of these you can look back on and see what people have done. So they're all here, so it's a, it's a good also resource for healthcare uh, visualizations. One of my initial goals in starting this project was one to increase healthcare visualizations uh, on Temple Public. I didn't think there were very many, or at least they were hard to find. And I work in healthcare, so I wanted to have more examples. Two was to increase awareness of different healthcare topics, so that you know. Whenever you're visualizing this stuff, often people are re doing some research. I've done, I spent many hours researching because I've gotten very involved in a story and been like, wow, I did not know this information. This is super interesting. Uh, and so that is another reason for it. And the third thing was, uh, the third was to d build a community of people who were in the healthcare, whether in the healthcare field, so they had a place to practice uh, data that was familiar to them. And lastly, was to create this uh, basically library of healthcare visualizations. So that's ultimately what this is, is now I have all these visuals that I can go back to and remember about what did, you know, what did people visualize? Um, you know, and so this is a fantastic now resource for, um, you know, different visuals of healthcare information. And so I love that I can go back here and look at all the stuff that great things people did. So people then have the whole month to complete it. Uh, I'm not, it's not like uh, rules. Like <laughs> if you take forever and you wanna, you know, half the time I'm a week late anyway. So it's, there's no like hard deadline. Like this is supposed to be fun. It's if you want to, right? Um, and you just tag hashtag project health is and me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, even doing it on Tableau Public helps if you put it down here, see how uh, Pradeep had done that, and then I can search for these things and that helps kind of get that um, library of healthcare visualizations. 
And then I also, uh, I'll provide feedback. Some people direct message me and say, hey, before I put this out there, can you give me some feedback? I'm happy to do that, especially when I have the time. Or they put it out on Twitter and say, all feedback welcome. I don't have a formal process for providing feedback at this point in time, mostly because I'm so busy, it's been challenging. I do wanna get into that where um, there's more of a better process for those who wanna get feedback. And then I do try to put all this together in some sort of blog post. So I've gone around um, with how I do some of my blogs, um, whether it's just I share my story, I share someone else's story, uh, I pick some favorites, I talk about suggestions in the blog post. I, I kind of come at it from different angles, but I always try to do a recap. I am at like three months behind, but I'll, I'll get there. Um, so if you participate, I try to collect everybody's and put them in the blog and then also you know, maybe call out a couple people um, for their visuals or something. So that's uh, pretty much how it works. It's been really great. The community has been fantastic. And there's been a lot of great um, visualizations created from it. We've had a number of visit the days, right? There's, there were, uh, I think there's like seven of them. There's one down there. Oh, maybe there's like eight. There's another one. So, you know, there's been a number of that. Tableau Public's very aware of the project and has promoted, um, this is the days for some of them as well. So another good opportunity to get just some you know, awareness. And like I said, the tracker is here. Um, if you do participate, you just press this little button and it'll take you to um, the submission tracker and you can put in your information uh, and the link to your biz. And that way it's kind of like quote on record and have it. You'll see um, some of these, um, like this one was a recap of a project health biz. And so um, you'll see, I explained some things, there may be some information and then everybody's, um, you know, this particular one, I gave feedback on each of them. Uh, it was a, not as many this month, so I was able to do that. So in the future, depending, some months have a lot more, so then I might just pick like a handful to do or see who wants it. So like, yeah. That's that. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Lindsay. I think I really appreciate you taking some time out and presenting on BizConnect. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. It was it was a lot of fun. I'm glad I had the opportunity. So you got a, a great little platform yes. going on. So thank you. Okay, and I think I will also look forward to all the polygons which people will create and I will send it across to you. Yep. Sounds great. Thanks a lot. Have a great weekend. Yeah. And yeah, take care. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Bye.